Good evening. Uh, my name is Stephen Shepard. I'm chair of the Department of Economics here at Williams. And I would like to welcome you to this evening's panel discussion, Cycle or Spiral, uh, Financial Markets in Crisis. Um, I just want to make a few opening remarks and observe uh, uncertainty, doubt, and confusion uh, were feelings that were uh, much in play over the last uh, three or four weeks as we were uh, organizing and planning this panel discussion. But in particular, uh, those feelings were relevant as to where exactly we were going to hold this panel discussion. Uh, to find a venue that would be large enough to accommodate all of the people who might want to participate and hear the views of our panelists uh, was surprisingly difficult. Chapin Hall was the natural venue, but uh, the music department had uh, reserved this space to rehearse their uh, wonderful F. Palooza II extravaganza, which will be presented tomorrow at 8 p.m. right here in Chapin. Uh, they were very kind in agreeing to shift their rehearsal to earlier in the evening, and I'd like to thank them for that, uh, and urge all of you who are able to, to come tomorrow at 8 and uh, hear, uh, hear and celebrate the, the talents of Williams student musicians, because it will be an impressive presentation. Tonight, though, we've come together for uh, a, a more serious uh, topic, a time of concern uh, not only for the uh, economic well-being of the college, uh, but of uh, our national economy and indeed the economies of many nations around the planet. Uh, all of us, uh, including economists and students and everybody in between, uh, are struggling to try to understand uh, the nature and extent of this crisis. Uh, to determine the implications for our lives, the institutions of, of, on which we depend, and for our careers. Uh, we're trying to analyze the factors that have contributed to this situation so that we can understand and even potentially advocate solutions that might address uh, the downturn and reduce, hopefully, the probability of similar events in the future. We're really fortunate at Williams to have alumni and faculty who are acknowledged experts and very important players in the financial markets uh, and the policymaking institutions that have been the focus of, uh, of attention for the past year, and in particular this fall. Uh, tonight, we've gathered some of the, the best to participate uh, in this discussion. Uh, each of them will make some brief remarks and observations about the present crisis and the types of questions that we should be asking. Uh, we'll then have an opportunity, uh, you will have an opportunity in particular, to pose questions about and hear discussion of the topics that are raised this evening. Uh, I want to just make a, introduce our, our panelists, beginning at your left. Our first panelist is Paul Isaac, who graduated with highest honors from Williams in 1972. Uh, he is managing partner, uh, chief investment officer, and investment committee member of, at the New York City-based hedge fund, uh, Cadogan Management. Before joining Cadogan in 1999, he was an analyst for the hedge fund SC Fundamental and served at uh, Mabon Nugent and Company as chief economist and uh, member of its board and executive committee. Our second panelist is James Lee who graduated from Williams in 1975 with majors in economics and art history, which I personally consider as almost the ideal liberal arts combination. Uh, Just barely got through. <laughs> that's all right. You made it. That's OK. Uh, in 1982, he founded Chemical Bank's Loan Syndications Unit, which was the beginning of Chemicals and then Chase Manhattan's investment banking business. Uh, he's now vice chairman of J.P. Morgan Chase and & Company and co-chairman of its investment bank. He serves on a number of nonprofit boards and on the private equity subcommittee of uh, Williams Finance Committee. Our third panelist is uh, my colleague Jerry Caprio, who graduated from Williams in 1972 with an economics major and now serves as chair of Williams Center for Development Economics. 
he came to Williams uh, in 2005 uh, after accumulating decades of experience. That makes him sound older than <laughs> maybe is ideal. <laughs> but he accumulated lots of important experience, That's let's good. just say. Uh, in inter international finance, including service as senior economist, uh, head of financial sector research, and director of financial sector policy at the World Bank. Uh, while he was at the bank, he created the first database on banking crises around the world, a database which has been updated by the World Bank since and continues to be used by the bank and the International Monetary Fund. His many writings include uh, the book, which you couldn't have chosen a better title to, to market in the present time, Financial Crises, Lessons from the Past, Preparation for the Future. Uh, our fourth uh, panelist is another colleague of mine, Professor Kenneth Kuttner, who has written extensively on macroeconomics, uh, including a co-authored uh, work with uh, Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke. He specializes in international economics, monetary policy, and the efficiency of central banks. Uh, Ken joined the uh, Williams Economics Department this year after spending several years at Oberlin. Uh, before that, he was a uh, senior economist and vice president at the Chicago Fed and assistant vice president at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Uh, the fifth member of our distinguished panel is Colette Chilton, who perhaps has more immediate responsibility for our well-being than any other member of this panel. Uh, she, <laughs> sorry, to, no pressure, no pressure. We'll see how it plays out, okay? Uh, she is responsible for the, the investment of the assets uh, in the Williams Endowment. Uh, before joining the college, she, in 2006, she served as president and chief investment officer for Lucent Technologies, where she was responsible for the investment and oversight of around $40 billion in retirement-related assets for the company. Um, before we begin, uh, it may be too dark for you to see, we'll bring the house lights up uh, in, in a few minutes, but uh, I want to draw your attention. There's a microphone down front here in the, uh, uh, in, in the center aisle. Uh, after all the panelists have provided introductory remarks and observations, we will open up for interaction between the panelists and questions from the audience, uh, as is the general rule here at Williams, students get first dibs on asking questions, and so I hope to hear some really good ones. Uh, be formulating your questions, guys. Uh, take advantage of this opportunity to pose questions uh, for the panel. Uh, so without further ado, let me turn the floor uh, to Paul Isaac for his take on the crisis. Okay, well this brings me this brings me back to uh, Williams because as a political economy major, I never had the mathematical skills to actually major in economics. And one book which I read my senior year, which I understand Jerry Caprio still now uses, Professor Caprio, now uses in his course, Paddock's Manias and Crashes by Charles Kindleberger, I think is a wonderful book. And actually, if anybody wants to pick it up, a great template where you can sort of fill in the specific nouns over the general nouns in terms of following what's going on today. Uh, in my opinion, this is a cycle, but it actually is a, uh, a, a series of overlapping cyclical phenomena overlaid on a very big uh, long-term economic cycle, which dates back to the liberalization of a whole series of, of uh, economic uh, of economies either in terms of trade, financial rules, or uh, macroeconomic management uh, that coincided with the sharp decline in inflation and um, uh, starting around and, and interest rates starting around 1980 or so. And during that period, we have systematically suppressed uh, interim cycles, partially through various forms of, of public intervention, whether it was the attempt to uh, to, to ameliorate. Uh, the effects of 9-11, the supposed problems we're going to have at Y2K, the effects of uh, 1998 and the emerging markets crisis. Um, and during this entire period, there has been a, a heightened sensitivity to interim real economic decline. We haven't had a serious recession in the United States since the early 1980s. And just like a forest that has a whole series of relatively 
uh, lush undergrowth, we developed a, a proliferation of some exotic financial and economic flora uh, that themselves were susceptible to cyclical excess and eventually turning down. Uh, among those were a, a commitment to various kinds of, of corporate growth, both in terms of executive compensation and uh, in terms of valuation of securities as a goal for securities holders, uh, a, uh, essentially an, an expectations of ROEs in a non-inflationary environment that uh, essentially lent themselves to uh, relatively leveraged financial structures, particularly in financial service industries, which grew from uh, roughly, I guess, 10 percent of the, of the S&P to roughly 40 percent of the S&P at their height. Um, it also uh, resulted in some changes in terms of consumer behavior because over time things like the steady growth and the value of residential housing and the negative real cost of uh, carrying houses in a, in a uh, non-inflationary, in a mod environment of modest inflation and low interest rates uh, resulted in a shift in consumer preferences towards residential housing investment that culminated in a fairly significant boom in the mid-2000s, uh, and that laid the groundwork for uh, a blow-off which uh, uh, interacted with another development, which was the proliferation of securitization technology uh, where I would argue that people went a bridge too far. In other words, this in one way, um, and I'll, I'll show why I didn't major in economics and wouldn't have succeeded if I did, uh, I think that in many ways this is the, uh, the comeuppance of a, a mathematical and empirical form of analysis for phenomena like housing because they had to use the data sets that they had and the relevant recent data sets didn't incorporate the possibility of either having a boom of this magnitude, because one hadn't occurred, it didn't incorporate the possibility of a significant downturn, uh, and therefore many of these financial structures were never stressed um, for the type of downturn that we've recently had. Um, finally, although we're going to get into the question of re-regulation, in many ways uh, the this is, you can argue this one back and forth, I would argue that there was, that regulation tends to be pro-cyclical, and, uh, and there were a lot of, of regulatory structures which were created designed to facilitate lower cost of capital and various kinds of what were seen as socially desirable extensions of low cost finance, that in many ways have turned out to be unstable during an economic downturn. So the, um, uh, I guess the, uh, what, what happened was starting in early 2006 with the downturn of housing, uh, you had a crisis in a fairly significant subsector of the mortgage market. That in turn uh, started to trigger um, a lack of availability for finance for various types of leveraged corporate finance transactions and the thing is propagated looking like a, you know, a, a kind of dominoes on LSD through various sorts of, of small sub-financial markets uh, which have tended to eventually culminate in some structural crises for very large financial institutions. Uh, probably the big change was we've been going through about 18 months of what I would characterize as whack-a-mole regulatory responses to problems <coughs> in specific areas. Uh, what really crystallized a systemic crisis was uh, uh, the failure of Lehman Brothers uh, turned out to have an unanticipated effect which was to cause the uh, breaking of the buck and the freezing of balances in one $60 billion independently managed money market fund which precipitated a general run on money market funds uh, since a fair number of businesses including industrial businesses were also using asset liability models which were not essentially self-liquidating something which I'm sure Jerry will get into because it's an area of his real expertise that triggered a liquidity crisis in the economy as a whole and at that point the, the, uh, I think there's been a shift from trying to deal with moral hazard issues in individual large institutions uh, to draw, trying to deal with uh, the possible macroeconomic effects of a seizing up of the financial system as a whole. Um, in general, uh, as I say, I think this is a cyclical phenomenon. This is not the Great Depression. Uh, we probably are going into a recession. I mean, people say this is the worst financial crisis since the, Great uh, since the Great Depression, and that's like comparing, you know, a World Wrestling Federation grudge match to the Civil War. Uh, in the Depression, you had a real decline in economic activity of something like 25 percent peak to trough, and you had a decline in nominal GDP of about 45 percent, uh, we may be starting to have a decline in real GDP, and we ha certainly haven't had a decline in nominal GDP. 
Uh, this is extremely expensive. You uh, basically had taken the aggregate national balance sheet up to about uh, one to one and a half turns above its long-term historical average, generally during bad financial um, cycles. It tends to undershoot to its historical average, and in doing that, you're going to lop $25 trillion off, or somewhere between 15 and $25 trillion off the collective mark-to-market -market net worth of somebody, and that is going to have some very real effects on people's 401ks to the extent that they are annuitants with bad, uh, bad timing in terms of when they intend to retire. It certainly is not going to be fun for the college, judging from the email I received last week. Um, there are going to be some real effects to this, but uh, I do not see this as a systemic crisis. This is not uh, the 1930s. There's been a tremendous change in economic structures. There is a tremendous change in both regulatory and uh, legislative response. Uh, we may be laying the groundwork for other problems down the road, which may be something we can get into later, but um, I see this as just a big, bad cycle, and sort of welcome to 1980, possibly on steroids. Great. Thank you, Paul. A big, bad cycle, or a grudge match, or civil war? <laughs> Jimmy? Okay, I'm up. Um, Paul, you can take a breath now. That was <laughs> uh, that was good, man. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I think I think you did okay in econ. Is my guess. Uh, Steve, thanks very much. Uh, appreciate it. It's great to be here. Um, I've been in Chapin Hall many times, but I think the only time I've been on the stage was when I was trying to meet uh, Pink Floyd, who actually played here twice. Believe it or not. So. Uh, <laughs> It's funny to be on this side of things. Um, I, I, also want to, I also want to say thank you to Morty. Uh, Morty is the one who uh, sort of lassoed me and said, hey, come up here and do this. Uh, fortunately for Morty, he never had me in any of his classes, um, which is probably good for both of us, is my guess. Um, but uh, you're, 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 you're a great president and a great role model, Morty. I, I, unfortunately, Roger Bolton did have me in his, many of his classes. I don't know if Roger's here tonight, but Roger is a longtime mentor uh, uh, of mine. And um, econ was very unpopular. Um, I graduated in 1975. And there were like, there were about, I think there were 12 kids in the class. So, and I sort of classify myself as kind of the only normal one in that class, um, whatever that means. Um, so I came here for two reasons. One is Morty asked me, and two is I wanted to see my daughter, Izzy. Um, those are my main reasons, and, and Steve sent me a lot of emails. Um, okay, let's get down to business uh, here. Um, you know, there's some things that Paul just said that I don't agree with, but there's one thing that we definitely agree on, and I think this is sort of the core issue, is, you know, welcome to the business cycle. And it always amazes me. I've been on Wall Street 34 years, and when I joined, I joined uh, Chemical Bank the year that I graduated. So I've literally worked for the same company the, all 34 years, although we changed the names multiple times. We kept upgrading. Now we've got J.P. Morgan, which is you know a little bit better than Chemical, um, but it's the same management team with one or two exceptions. But you know, I joined in the late '70s, and as Paul mentioned, that was just a, a horrendous time. Late '70s, early '80s, '87. Um, um, there was you know the famous October crash in the stock market, which led ultimately to a you know another big bad event, which was the '90-'92 recession. By 1997, uh, I think that was long-term capital, 97, I want to say, 98. So, you know, that was the end of the world. Uh, then the world was coming to an end yet again in 2001 when the tech bubble burst, more or less. And, of course, now the end is coming soon, as we all know, in 2008. So, you know, I'm probably a little jaded on this topic. And I just, what amazes me, actually, is how surprised people get when we get into, you know, the deep dark hole that we're in right now. It's like, wait a minute, the business cycle, there's the up part and there's the down part. This is the down part. So no one has repealed the business cycle um, yet. Um, Steve uh, and I agreed that I talk a little bit about, um, you know, kind of, you know, from my perspective, I guess I'd be sort of the applied economist up here as opposed to the 
the theorist, but uh, just a bunch of points that I'll quickly make and then turn the, turn the mic over. One is, um, you know, unlike the Great Depression, this government, uh, and in particular uh, Treasury Secretary Paulson and a guy named Tim Geithner who runs the New York Fed, you know, from my perspective, they've been unbelievable. And this is the part I disagree probably with Paul on. I don't think that it's whack-a-mole. I think when you're running on about two to three hours sleep and you've been doing it for about, I don't know, 60, 70 days, which is kind of what I've been doing, but of course I'm not carrying the economy on my back like, like Paulson is or some of these other guys, Bernanke, uh, it, it is not easy to do all this. And to say, well, geez, you shouldn't have let Lehman go because didn't you know about AIG? I mean, trust me, this is, you're, you're sort of like going through the haunted house and you go around the corner and something jumps out at you. I mean, it, it's very, very difficult. And even Greenspan said today down in Washington, uh, someone was, you know, sort of railing on him for something uh, in these hearings. And he said, you know what, at the Fed, we think we're pretty lucky if we can forecast correctly 60% of the time, which means, therefore, we're wrong 40% of the time. So how do you build regulatory frameworks when you're wrong 40% of the time with your forecasting? So anyhow, that would, that's my view on that one. Uh, Broker-dealers. Broker-dealers, you know, that's Lehman, that's Bayer, that's Merrill, that's Morgan Stanley, that's Goldman Sachs. They have occupied the news. Why did they occupy the news? They were leveraged about 30 times and they had no demand deposits. So <clears throat> they had all these long-dated assets. They were funding themselves basically overnight, more or less. And the money dried up, and so that's always a bad corporate finance strategy. Um, bank holding company. Now, that phrase is in the news these days. Now, back in the day, we, we actually at the bank tried to do a deal with one of these broker-dealers in the mid-'90s. We were trying to buy them. I'm not going to mention any names. And they said, you know, Jimmy, why on earth would you, would we, we're free, want to be imprisoned by the regulation of bank holding company? Well, you know, Morgan Stanley and Goldman and, and a few others were like begging through the month of September to be a bank holding company. So, um, you know, wel welcome to our world. That's what happened. Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs are now both banks, so they'll be heavily regulated. Someone said to me the other day, they said, uh, well, I guess McCain has lost big time, and um, so why would you even, you know, why would you even feel differently about that? And I said, well, why do you think he's lost uh, so clearly? And they said, well, geez, there's, you know, only three weeks left to go, and he's behind by 10 points. And this person said to me, well, what can happen in three weeks? And I said, well, let's look at September for a second. Fannie, Freddie, Lehman, Merrill, Wachovia, WAMU, AIG, all either bought um, or dead. Uh, Lehman was the only one that sort of died, which uh, Paul alluded to, and maybe we can talk about that in a sec. Um, so a lot can happen in three weeks, obviously. Um, the economy, I was just going to finish up and make a couple of brief comments before my much more intelligent colleagues um, talk about stuff like this. The economy is in bad shape, um, and it's not in as bad shape as it will get, probably, is my guess, simply because the consumer has been on strike. Um, you know, in the month of September and most of the month of October, we have a lot of credit card data, obviously, at the bank and mortgage data, and, you know, people are not buying cars. People are not buying refrigerators. Obviously, people are not buying houses. So the airlines, the car companies, um, any, you know, any, any sort of travel, the banks themselves, of course. So all of that, all that data is just beginning now to flow through um, the system. UPS reported this morning, and they, you know, they were talking about tough times. So all of this is going to go, this, all of this will, will, will flow through. It would probably be a pretty tough holiday season because people feel poor. When people are afraid and they feel poor, they just don't spend any money. So whether you're rich or you're poor, if you feel that way, you just spend whatever you were spending, you spend um, less. Um, when, will, um, when will this change? A lot actually has to do with the banks, uh, believe it or not. Um, banks need to start lending again. And one question, and Steve, maybe this will, we'll talk about this, is, well, geez, didn't 
Hank just dole out $125 billion to the banks to help them to get, start lending again. Well, it's not actually the recapitalization process, which really has to occur, is the last point that I'll just talk about for a sec. Um, recapitalizing the banks is one part of bringing the economy back. That always takes time. It takes several quarters at least for banks to actually start making some money. Some banks cut their dividends. Uh, some banks raise capital. Uh, nine banks received capital. Um, and they will lend again. Another gating item to uh, the economy improving is banks have to feel that their clients are actually stabilized, i.e., they're not going to get worse. They actually are stable and might get better. So banks need to have sort of an, you know, an optimistic view of the prospects of the folks to whom they're lending money. So that's sort of the dark side of things. A potential bright, bright side is uh, we will shortly have a new president. And I think that's going to bring a lot of hope to a lot of people, whoever that, whoever that gentleman is. It won't be the person who's had the job for the last eight years. I think you know, a lot of Republicans and Democrats will feel, will feel uh, positive about that, frankly. But there will be a stimulus package. I'm sure there can be a lively debate amongst the folks up here on the panel. Are stimulus packages good or bad? I don't know, but there probably will be one, and it will be hundreds of billions of dollars. That will be ultimately a good short-term stimulus uh, to the economy. And the price of energy, which was in the news every day, flashing on CNBC, they had like a little, you know, spot at the bottom, crude price, crude price, crude price. Now they don't even talk about it because it's not that interesting because it's now down from the highs and looks like uh, it'll, go, it'll go much lower. And that's one of the great things about the American consumer. He and she, they're pretty smart. Gas gets real expensive, they just don't drive. So the demand for gas has just gone through the floor, which is dragging these prices down. There's other issues involved too, but you know, there's a great energy story out there. So I do think there's a silver lining here. I'm sure we'll talk about job prospects later. And um, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Jimmy. Jerry. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Steve. Um, uh, these are certainly interesting times, and as Steve alluded to, um, I had put together this data on crises around the world and also worked in a few countries uh, that were in the middle of banking crises, and uh, much of this seems very familiar. Uh, it was interesting that uh, about uh, two years ago, I was asked to write a paper for a handbook on banking, uh, doing the chapter on banking crises, and they said, uh, be sure to explain, given that we have, really haven't had any serious crises since uh, the East Asian crisis in 1997, what accounts for the end of banking crises? Um, fortunately, it took a while to do that chapter, and so by the end of that, they stopped bothering me for that, that extra section. Um, I found myself in agreement with, uh, with many of the comments you've heard, especially of my, uh, my classmate, Paul Isaac, who, by the way, you should not believe his self-deprecating comments. He was one of the most brilliant people in, in, in my class, and uh, uh, classmates at reunions regularly uh, agree on that uh, time and again. Um, I thought I would talk a little bit about um, why is, is the, uh, this crisis such an international crisis, and why does it seem so, um, so serious? Um, I, I do, I guess I, I would differ with Paul in one respect. I guess I would call this a systemic crisis, but that might open up a, a debate as to, to what do you mean by systemic. I think the good news is, and, and Ken will probably elaborate on this, uh, and that is that the, the Federal Reserve started easing aggressively a year ago. And that's one dramatic difference uh, with Japan in the 1990s and also with, uh, with the Great Depression. But the, the, the global nature of this crisis um, uh, is a bit different. Financial globalization since 1980 uh, has gone up about four to five times, judging by the percentage of international assets in the portfolios of U.S. investors and uh, of U.S. assets in the hands of, uh, of foreign investors. Uh, this is, we've seen a generalized bubble in a number of countries' uh, housing markets, Ireland, Spain, UK, uh, uh, large parts of France, 
uh, some regions in China. Uh, this reflected an adjustment uh, similar to what Paul was saying. Uh, interest rates around the world were relatively low in 2002, 2003, really near record lows. And in many banking crises, we see them preceded by asset bubbles. And those asset bubbles usually are, are linked to an abundance of liquidity and very low interest rates. And when interest rates are very low, investors uh, tend to start nudging further and further out on what economists call the risk frontier, taking more and more risk. But when they do it all together, it looks like they're making winning decisions and they congratulate themselves and do still more. Um, it's hard otherwise to account for um, not just the fact that foreign countries are being affected by what's going on in the U.S., but we're seeing some of the same things that are being uncovered in the U.S., high rates of leverage, people borrowing to take more risk in many countries, in Eastern Europe, in Iceland, uh, people borrowing in foreign currency because the interest rate was low for their mortgages. When people are doing that, you know this sort of sentiment in favor of gambling is, is remarkably well, uh, widespread. And uh, that's one of the features of the, the book that Paul mentioned, uh, Charlie Kindleberger's book, does such a nice job uh, of explaining. Um, there's a blame game going on about, you know, is this a U.S. crisis or a European crisis? Um, uh, one could really overly simplify this by saying we, we originated a lot of the bad mortgages and they bought a lot of the bad mortgages. Um, you could also then ask, well, why did they buy a lot of the bad mortgages? Well, actually, because of interest rates being low, a number of their insurance companies were insolvent. They had promised to pay higher rates of interest than they could earn on the market. And so they started taking more and more um, risk. Um, what we also saw in a number of countries is an incentive system in finance that really sort of went off the charts with compensation uh, that was rewarding risk-taking uh, at absolutely breathtaking levels. And if you reward risk-taking generously, people will take more risks. And that's what we saw. Um, you also saw reliance on the same approach to regulating the sector, or similarities, especially in commercial banking, where the emphasis was what uh, is on what's called prudential supervision. It used to be that we regulated banks by controlling their interest rates and not letting them do much. And as uh, there was a wave of financial liberalization, in the 1970s and 80s in industrial countries, we allowed banks to do uh, more and more uh, things, and we uh, then started supervising them with, uh, in the U.S., an abundance of supervisory agencies. Last year, we spent $4 billion on the budgets of those supervisory agencies. Um, spending on prudential supervision was also uh, at high levels in, in Europe and, uh, and Japan. You can think of it as if we built... Uh, this sort of wonderful Maginot line, a static approach to regulation, and now people seem to be surprised that they actually went around it. And that's what a lot of the, the financial innovations uh, had the uh, effect of. If you wanted to keep this really simple, uh, the easiest way I know is to think of a very old movie uh, by Charlie Chaplin called The Mechanical Age, where um, it's a pie factory and they're having pies that in the final stage are proceeding along this conveyor belt. Of course, since it's a Charlie Chaplin movie, you can figure out that something goes wrong with the conveyor belt and the pies pile up in an absolute mess. Well, that's a certain extent what's happened in the financial sector. It's happened as a result of the banks not holding much liquidity anymore. They used to hold a lot of reserves. And uh, when they were deregulated, those reserves uh, came down. And secondly, the complexity of the instruments that uh, they were holding increased uh, 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 significantly. This led to a loss of information. It was hard for one bank to know how good or bad is another bank. You used to be able to look at its balance sheet and at least form a reasonable guess. But it's very difficult to do that these days when uh, institutions are holding so many of their risks um, off balance sheet. Um, last, I would focus on uh, uh, this notion that financial innovation has come along and gotten ahead of regulation. And um, sometimes, uh, and uh, Obama's campaign has been saying this, that um, you know, we had regulation that was good for the 1990s, 
um, uh, but the markets changed and it was no longer effective. And maybe in the question and answer session we can come back to discuss this, but to a certain extent, as Paul alluded, that's always been the problem with regulation. Um, it, we have a system which has a lot of rules measured in inches of file space or megabytes that the regulations take up. Uh, uh, it, it's unprecedented. Um, the salary or the, the costs of regulation are very high. But there's been less of attention devoted to the incentives in the sector. And so as we reform this, the regulatory approach, we really have to think about um, moving away from such a rules-based approach and really focusing on the incentives in the, for the actors in the sector. All right, turn it over. <coughs> Thank you, Jerry. Uh, Ken? All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, as an ex-low-ranking Fed official, I thought my comparative advantage would be to talk about the, what the Fed has been doing in recent weeks, recent months. The Fed is obviously at the center of the storm. Uh, it's, uh, in fact, I can hardly think of a day that's gone by without seeing my ex-co-author Ben Bernanke's picture on the front of the, either the Financial Times or the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, and he's usually not looking very happy. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so the, uh, my presentation tonight, my five minutes, going to, I'm going to try to address three questions. Number one is what has the Fed been doing? Number two, why has it been doing what it's been doing? And number three, will it work? All right, so a uh, little bit of background, and this is something that uh, Jimmy already touched on a little bit. The, from the Fed standpoint, the background, or the, the epicenter of all this, is the money market. The money market being the market where firms, financial firms, non-financial firms, obtain very short-term funding, overnight, one week, 30 days. And uh, the U.S. financial system is very heavily reliant on these short-term money markets. So I think combined, I think the repo market and, and, the, and the commercial paper market, uh, about $4 trillion dollars. Now, uh, that worked fine for a long time, and it worked fine. A lot of these loans were collateralized, which means that firms who needed funds, firms that needed funds would be able to put up collateral, borrow against the collateral, and at the end of the day or the end of the week, they would return the collateral and get the funds back. Well, as Jerry said, thanks to a lot of factors, including the deterioration in credit quality and the decreased transparency of many of these instruments, firms are no longer able to borrow against that collateral general loss of confidence in the quality of the collateral and also in the borrowing institutions. And that is basically uh, threatened to bring these markets to a screeching halt. So we had an implosion of credit obtained by, uh, by brokers and dealers. I was just thinking, looked at some numbers earlier today. And uh, in the second quarter of 2008, uh, the um, volume of credit going to brokers and dealers was down about $250 billion. They had about a trillion to begin with. So in, in one quarter, that was cut by one-fourth. I'm sure the numbers would be even worse in the next quarter. And at the same time, there's a collapse in the market for commercial paper. Again, that started out to be about a 1.8 trillion market. As of the second quarter, that was down about 450 billion. So a huge chunk has been taken out of that, too. Well, that's a lot of big numbers, but you're probably thinking, so what? Well, the so what is this. If these firms can't obtain the overnight funding, they can't pay their bills, and if they can't pay their bills, then the people to whom they're getting their, who were expecting to receive the funds, they won't be able to pay their bills either, and you're talking about dominoes. It's just like a bank run, just like It's a Wonderful Life, except the institutions are bigger, and it's not Jimmy Stewart, it's, uh, what's his name, Richard Fold. So, uh, <clears throat> so this is where the Fed comes in. Uh, we, all think of the Fed, uh, we all think of the Fed's main job as adjusting interest rates, adjusting the Fed funds rate, and in a normal environment, that's what it would do. Well, this is not a normal environment. This is an environment where the Fed has, to, uh, has the obligation to exercise the option of its lender of last resort role, this lender of last resort. So what does the lender of last resort do? A lender of last resort is an institution with deep pockets. Uh, in the Fed's case, it has unlimited pockets, but the idea of a lender of last resort is for an institution to come in and lend money to distressed firms who are temporarily unable to obtain the financing through the normal channels. So what the Fed is basically doing through uh, its various facilities, I think it's uh, started about uh, six, seven different facilities, all the, some different combination of letters, uh, PDCF, TAF, I've lost track of them all, I have them in my notes somewhere. They've gone in and basically started making loans that nobody else is willing to make in an effort to simply stave off a collapse. Now ideally, the trick in uh, discharging the function of a lender of last resort, central banks have been doing this for, for centuries. Uh, almost as long as Jerry has been, uh, uh, been working at the World Bank and the IMF. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> the trick in this is always to figure out when you're lending money to good institutions that are just hitting a rough patch versus lending money to bad institutions. 
And that's a real judgment call. And, you know, and so the Fed and everybody else decided not to lend money to Lehman. And was that a good call or a bad call? I don't know. I have no inside information on that. But uh, the, uh, the upshot of all this is the Fed has just has just blown all previous records off the charts in terms of lending to the private sector. It's extended about $1 trillion worth of credit to the private sector, which is just mind-boggling, given that you, before all this happened, the Fed's balance sheet was only $850 billion. So they've pumped, up the, they've pumped up the balance sheet by about a factor of two, and uh, they've, uh, you know, the balance sheet is up to, to $1.7 trillion now. And uh, not, only have, not only is the scale of this mind-boggling, but the scope is mind-boggling as well. In normal times, the Fed makes just a little bit of loans to banks and, you know, maybe a billion here, billion there. And uh, it has never, within modern, uh, in modern history, lent money to non-banks, to insurance companies. Well, that's what's happened now. It's lent money to J.P. Morgan. It's lent money to AIG. This is completely unprecedented, at least, you know, the modern Fed history. So in scale and scope, again, this is, this is off the charts. And I should, uh, I think Jerry mentioned the Bank of Japan. I should mention that uh, even the Bank of Japan went through a very bad period in the, in the 1990s and 2000s. Eventually, the Bank of Japan uh, greatly increased their lending too. But the scale of that, well, the scale was comparable. But the bank, what the Bank of Japan did not do that the Fed is doing now is the Bank of Japan uh, only lent very limited funds to the banks and, and other financial institutions. They created liquidity primarily just by, bank, by buying uh, um, Japanese government bonds. So, so what the Fed is doing is very different from that. So we get to the really, I guess the uh, most important question is whether it will work. <laughs> and uh, I guess that depends on, <laughs> not to sound too much like Bill Clinton, but I guess that means on what, it depends on what you mean by work. And uh, so, uh, you know, I think, it's, uh, I think there's no question that it's working in the sense that it's prevented so far collapse. Uh, and uh, so in that sense, what the Fed is doing is triage. It's basically, you know, Bernanke's out there with the defibrillator, you know, kind of wake up, you know. And, um, but the question is, is that going to solve the deeper problem, the deeper problem being all the things that Jerry and the other panelists mentioned with the deeper problem of regulation, the deeper problem of poorly capitalized institutions, the deeper problem of lack of transparency? And the answer to that is clearly no. The Fed's resources are, are obviously very limited. It can only do so much. It can provide liquidity. It can prevent you know, this domino effect of institutions collapsing. But after that, it's up to the regulators, it's up to the treasury, it's up to, you know, the other guys to do the coronary bypass, really. So uh, finally, uh, this is all, you know, the people at the Fed, I'm sure, are going nuts because this is completely uncharted territory. And I'm sure they're warning about un un unintended consequences. One thing that often pops up in the situation is moral hazard. That's kind of a generic feature of any kind of a bailout uh, thing like what the treasury is doing and, and really not specific to the Fed. But one thing the Fed is, uh, one implication, or potential implication of what the Fed has been doing uh, because of the scale and scope of, what it's, of its operations is the Fed has taken on a certain amount of credit risk, which it's never done before. Uh, in the past, when the Fed has simply bought treasury securities, you know, those are not going to default. But now it has all these assets on the books that, you know, there's some theoretical possibility it would not get, pay get paid back on. So that raises a bunch of very interesting questions. So, you know, so, well, what does it mean for a central bank to become bankrupt? Can that happen? Does that have a meaning? Uh, but uh, sort of the way to think about that is that if that were to happen, if the Fed were to lend funds to some institution, the institutions did not pay that back, that would essentially turn the Fed from, you know, instead of being a lending to entities, it would be, instead of lending money, it would be spending money. And that gets the Fed into some very dangerous territory because the Fed is not supposed to be spending money. It's the Treasury, it's the government that's spending money. And it's not the Fed's job to do that. The Fed's job is to be there, like, you know, controlling interest rates and making loans. So that would be, uh, I'm, sure my, uh, uh, I'm sure my old friends at the Fed are staying awake nights worrying about things like that. But I'll end there and uh, turn it over to the really cheery part of the program. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Well, um, I actually am so glad to be here tonight because now I understand why my job has been so hellish for the past couple <laughs> of months is everything that these guys have um, been talking about and how it's been impacting us in the investment office. Um, the first thing I'll say is I feel so much better. Is that better? I feel so much better hearing um, Paul and Jimmy say that it's a cycle because that's how it feels to me. And when people say it's the end of the world and it's the Great Depression, you begin to doubt yourself and think you should be going all to cash. Um, but in fact, I agree with them. I, I do think it's a cycle. Um, and I was reminded of that today at a private equity annual meeting where um, the person making the presentation put a slide up and it went through all the reasons why 
Um, people were saying, it's the end of the world, it's never been like this before, this time it's different. And in fact, it was a slide that they had used in 2001 at their annual meeting, and it was exactly the same situation that we're in today. So it's a um, good reminder that, it, in fact, it is a cycle, and um, markets go up and markets go down, and unfortunately, right now, they're, they're pretty down. So um, my topics tonight are a little less theoretical and a little more um, realistic, probably, to everybody in the audience, and um, focusing really on what's the impact on Williams. And um, before I'll talk about the specifics of that, um, the, the thing to remember is that um, the reason that there is an endowment and there is an investment office is to fund the college. Um, sometimes people lose sight of that when you're running multi-billion dollar endowments and you think that you're um, an investor. What you really are is the bank for the college. And so um, I said that to Bill Lenhart once and, and he constantly reminds me of that. You're just the bank for the college. But in fact, that's what we are. We're here to fund the college. And so um, that has a lot of implications in a time like this. The, the two things that we're really most focused on are, um, the primary thing is liquidity. And um, what that means on a day-to-day -day basis is we need to make sure that we have the money that the college needs to run the college. And it's um, not very glamorous, and it's not as probably as interesting as what some of the other panelists have to say, but in order for Morty and Bill to make payroll, we need to have the money for them. And in order for many of the kids in the audience to get financial aid, we need to have money for them. And um, we're very, very focused on that at this point. I would say that the um, seven of us in Boston meet every day around 4 o'clock to talk about liquidity. And how are we going to fund the managers who are going to ask us for money? How are we going to fund the college? Um, it sounds really easy, and it's incredibly complicated right now. And um, as unpleasant as it can be, I would say that my job and people who have jobs in college and university endowment offices right now have never had such a fascinating time um, in their careers um, because there's the confluence of so many different things. And um, the impact of it is not theoretical at all. It's very real. Um, and you see it on campus, you see it in the people that it impacts, you see it in the buildings, it's, it's everywhere. And so um, we, we take it very seriously and we are spending a ton of time on liquidity right now, uh, much as these guys are all focusing on the same issues for their institutions. Um, the second thing, which is a little bit more of a long-term problem, but in some ways um, very tied to the liquidity issue is, um, we are the ultimate long-term investors. We are investing in some ways for eternity. We're investing money to make sure we have enough to support the college today, but it's also important for us to make enough money to support um, students and faculty who are gonna be here in five and 10 and 20 and 50 years. So Morty talked at dinner tonight about the avail rate going above 5%. The more you spend today, um, the harder it is to support um, Williams in the future. So our challenge is to make enough both for today and the long term. And in a market like this, it's pretty tough. And so one of the ways that we do that is we stick to the policy that the um, investment committee of the board has set. It's called the asset allocation policy. And it's very tempting in times like this to drift from it because the market is um, drifting for us. So when the market is down 20% month after month after month, as it has been for the past couple months, um, it's very difficult to stay at our policy allocation. And if we don't stay at that policy allocation, it has very dramatic impacts over the long term, and it makes it more and more difficult to fund the college. So those are two, the two things that we are really focused on. The li liquidity is day by day, minute by minute. Where are we going to get the money to do what we need to do? And the asset allocation is much more um, long-term, but incredi incredibly important to keep sight of um, on the day-to-day -day basis. So, um, so those, those are the two things we're most focused on. One of the things that um, I'm supposed to be talking about um, is future prospects for the college and its growth and development. And that's something I'm gonna leave to Morty. 
um, because he talked about it in his email over the weekend, and I think it's a much broader topic than what we're doing in the investment office and how it impacts um, everyone in the college community. Um, but certainly having enough money to do what everyone does is, is really important, and um, we take that pretty seriously. Um, so moving on to probably more interesting things for a lot of the people here is what does that mean for students who are at Williams? And I know everyone here wants to talk a little bit about that. Um, but before they do, I'm going to put a plug in for um, careers in endowment offices. And um, it's a fascinating time to be doing what we do. And um, we are offering a winter study in January. And we had two kids in our office over the summer. Caitlin McGugan, who's here, was one of them. Um, Rick Devlin was also with us over the summer. And we kept saying to them, you guys don't understand what an incredible time this is. Um, but Caitlin is actually the one who did the analysis that Morty referred to at dinner tonight about what the diversification we did in the portfolio, um, how much that helped protect us, um, and how things would have been much worse had we not done that. And Caitlin actually did that analysis, um, so we were able to tell Morty um, how impactful that was. So we are going to have two summer interns next summer, or three, um, or maybe many, many more, depending on what the other opportunities are for, um, for Williams kids. Um, and um, so it's, it's just a fascinating time to, to be um, in the intersection of the market, capital markets, um, debt issuance for the college, funding college programs, um, and as a student at Williams, if you have the opportunity either with our office or another investment office, it's, you know, it doesn't get any better than this um, from my perspective as far as your career. Um, I actually think that times of stress and distress are much better for your career than easy times. Um, and that's when you really learn a lot. And if you can find the right place, to do something like that, whether it's a summer job or after you graduate in June, um, it's, it's going to be much more meaningful uh, for your career long term. So with that, I'll turn it over. Great. Thank you very much, Colette. Um, we've, heard, uh, we've, we've heard a great set of descriptions of the current situation, ranging from grudge matches to whack-a-mole to uh, uh, not press, you know, just the, just the downward part of the business cycle to great opportunity to get stressed out and learn a lot. Uh, this is a chance now for you to have, uh, to, to have questions, so I invite people who might want to pose questions to, to come down uh, to the mic. And uh, let, let me start, while that kind of is shaking out and forming, uh, to, to invite uh, uh, responses to uh, amongst the panelists. Anybody have uh, a remark they want to make? Paul? The fact that it's cyclical doesn't mean it's necessarily going to repeat itself. Um, the, there could be some very significant changes for a variety of reasons in either how financial markets behave or how people behave economically. Good example, and this I'll, I'll defer to the economists on the, on the panel, but Back on the Fed definition, we had a, something like an 8 to 10 percent savings rate in the United States out of consumer incomes at one time. That declined to zero to negative 1 percent, uh, partially because there was a shift in consumer balance sheets where people were relying in large part on appreciation residential real estate in terms of meeting certain types of long-term uh, funding needs for their demographic goals. Now, you know, if you go back to having an 8 to 10 percent savings rate, even if it takes place over a very long period of time, that has some real implications for the U.S. economy. Certain types of investments, whether or not um, they uh, might theoretically make sense, may become uh, either illegal or, or uh, unacceptable for a fiduciary or, you know, just something that you don't do anymore. Um, there's, there is a certain tendency on the part of endowment committees uh, sometimes to take a look at asset classes that really were debacles and sort of say maybe there's a good guy in there but let's just kill them all and maybe come back and look at it later. So you can have some very big changes in terms of both financial markets and 
uh, and types of economic phenomena from big cyclical changes. And, and so I don't want to give people the idea that, well, it's going to be 2005 all over again in a couple of years. I think you could have some very real uh, changes in both institutions and, um, and uh, people's and investment behavior coming out of this. Thanks. Uh, we've got some questions here, so step up to the mic and... Well, uh, first, thank you all for coming. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, with times of great economic uncertainty come many people who offer advice. And there's a huge advice market now. Everyone is proclaiming themselves to be an expert as to what we should be doing. So both in terms of um, where we might want to go as students and in terms of our parents' uh, college funds or whatever else, who's good to listen to and who's not good to listen to? Because lots of people want to be listened to and some haven't turned out so well. Uh, we don't have panels like this every day. <laughs> um, there's something called the know your customer rule. So everybody's individual financial situation is different. So the last thing I think we should be doing is giving people financial advice on their personal circumstances. Look, my father graduated from NYU in 1928. Uh, basically, he worked for the largest bank in the United States that ever failed up to that date in 1931. It turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to him because he wound up getting a job on Wall Street and didn't, as he put it, retire as a branch manager in the Bronx. Um, the, uh, I graduated in 1972, had a Watson until 1974, couldn't get a job on Wall Street because nobody was hiring wound up going into the nut, bolt, and screw business for a couple of years um, and actually found it to be a wonderful experience and training for being in the financial industry. I also happen to have had the ill fortune to have been a general partner in a partnership that effectively failed uh, during a time when that was not a public issue and, you know, spent several years of my life uh, as part of a group crash landing that thing. So most careers are not a matter of undiluted success. You guys are kind of unlucky in terms of when you're coming out um, in the sense that it's not an abulient job market. But there are lots of things to do. Um, and, and to the extent, actually, that it forces you to think about, am I really interested in the application of certain types of skills and interests to things like business and finance, as opposed to going down to Wall Street because people tell me I can make a lot of money in five years, that's probably not a bad you know, clarification to have. Um, the, I do think Wall Street, which burgeoned from 25,000 people to 400,000 people over the last 50 years in New York, will change. It's not going to be quite as innovative or dynamic as it probably was because there will be a greater degree of conservatism for some time. There are always things to do. There are always interesting jobs. It's a series of overlapping uh, markets. And if you genuinely have an interest in the material and find it temper suits your temperament, you know, you'll find your way in it. But, you know, what would be a good job to look for now? Well, probably the FDIC is going to be hiring a lot of examiners. I think we're going <laughs> around for a couple of years looking at the portfolios of busted banks might actually be a really interesting thing to do between Williams and Business School, and I think there are going to be a lot of things like that out there. Uh, Colette, you might, do you have a, a comment on advice? advice? <laughs> Um, in the media, who to listen to? Excuse me? In the media, who to listen to? Oh, in the media, well, Aaron Burnett. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know um, in the media who to listen to. Um, I, I, think, um, I think, you know, one thing that we're doing through all of this is trying not to spend too much time listening to the talking heads because you do get lost in the noise. And, um, you know, we just keep saying, you know, stay the course. Um, you know, we're, for us, that means being fully invested. And um, every day the market goes down, it hurts. It doesn't feel good. Um, and I think my personal opinion is it's going to get worse before it gets better. I think the fourth quarter is going to be worse than the third quarter um, for a variety of reasons. Um, but for us, it's just, you know, stay the course. and you know, stick to your policy, so to speak, and that's different per, for individuals than it is for institutions. So, Jerry? Since this relates to the, the depth and the length, length of the cycle, I guess I'd like to interject here. I'm glad that Paul clarified his comments on the cycle, which sounded um, shorter and less serious the first time he said it. Um, uh, it's been a long time since I got paid for forecasting. It's a thankless art. But um, 
one can tell a story that this will be uh, a pretty serious cycle, that a, a good chunk of U.S. economic growth since about 2001 um, has been financed by consumer borrowing, uh, people taking money out of their homes uh, and using it to finance consumption. And, uh, and that window is shut, and it's probably going to stay shut for a while. Even if banks succeed in getting more capital when, and more private sector capital, so even if they got lucky and sovereign wealth funds from around the world descend on the U.S. banking system and inject a lot of capital, I have yet to see a country with a crisis this serious where the new owners say, you know, you guys have been doing a great job on risk management. Just keep doing what you're doing. Instead, they're going to have fairly stiff controls on lending, and so credit is going to be relatively tight for a while. So with those forces, and if housing continues to go down, maybe only 10 percent more, um, uh, one can have uh, a pretty bleak outlook that goes beyond uh, a quarter or two. So I, I wouldn't put myself in the uh, Nuri or Rubini camp of it's time to, uh, uh, you know, get your space in a cave. Um, uh, uh, I, I, I at least uh, be a little bit cautious. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, I'm Andy. Um, we've heard both presidential candidates talk about tax breaks to put money back in the pockets of uh, people, most likely in the hopes that this would lead to an increase in spending. I was wondering if you could comment briefly on the effectiveness of putting money back into the pockets of the relatively rich versus the relatively poor. Also, if this is a question strictly of uh, marginal p propensity to consume or if there are other factors at play. Um, and just talk about uh, tax cut strategies. Thanks. Uh, well, I might uh, want to, let's see, I think I have a couple of Econ 252 students out here. Derek, you want to come up here and answer that? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be in the second midterm, don't worry. <laughs> well, the, uh, uh, the, one, of the, one of the things we learned from uh, in Econ 252 is a lot depends on the nature of the tax cut. I mean, what we saw in the last round of tax cuts was uh, because it's just a temporary increase in income, people are going, to are going to end up saving most of it. And in fact, only maybe 20 cents in the dollar, maybe 22 cents in the dollar of the, ta of the recent tax cuts were spent. The rest was saved, which is quite sensible, really. So, um, but in terms, of the, that's the, in terms of broad efficacy, that's the thing you have to take into account. And you, you did ask the question of, uh, of whether it would be more effective targeted to the less well-off compared to the more well-off. They think the answer is probably going to be yes. And the reason is that the people at the, you know, who are living more hand to mouth in terms of, you know, they're only spending what their what income is coming in, they're going to tend to spend more of whatever tax rebate you give them, whatever tax cut you give them, than somebody who is has them has savings built up and doesn't really need that additional money to pay the current bills. So from a standpoint of macroeconomic effectiveness, I think all my 252 students would agree that the smart way to do this would be to make it more long-lasting, or at least the perception is longer-lasting, and to target the lower end of the spectrum, as you suggested. Okay. Is that right? <laughs> Thumbs up from the 52 students. Um, thanks a lot for injecting uh, positive hopes to our minds and underlying the fact that it is a business cycle, not the doom. Um, my question is about uh, the oil and how it is related to the crisis. Because like three months ago when I came here, uh, it was about $115. Now it is down to $70. And uh, I heard that the last week, uh, Russian stock market got closed off twice a day. And uh, how it is related? Is this the oil prices that are affecting the crisis or this, uh, the other way around, uh, the mortgage system, the crisis affecting the oil prices to go down? And shouldn't the oil prices going down have a positive effect on the economy to bring it up? Or how does the cyclical thing work between the crisis and the oil? Um, well, Paul, you want to take that, or uh, you want to try? No, okay. go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> One of the problems here is when you get into this type of, of series of uh, propagating financial events, you know, it's sort of like the old, I forget which British historian said it, you know, history is just one damn thing after another. The, um, the, you had a commodity boom that was partially based on perceptions of growth and scarcity of supply. 
and, and some of that in oil specifically was a long-standing debate as to whether or not we are running into the limits, geological limits of oil, or whether or not there is a very sharply escalating uh, supply cost curve for incremental supplies of oil, and at times when people were talking about very rapid growth, particularly in India, China, some of the emerging markets, um, that resulted in a very ebullient market for a whole bunch of commodities, particularly oil. Um, that certainly helped Russia because it's its primary export, and uh, it created a, a the class of the legendary Russian oligarchs who in turn were uh, very aggressively leveraging their assets in Russia apparently in order to buy assets, other assets in safer places or to repeat their triumphs in Russia and other markets. Um, what's happened is that as there's a perception that the financial problems are going to feed back into a possible recession, um, a lot of the air has come out of the commodities boom. And in many cases, commodities booms really can, can go down because during a boom, people kind of top their tank. There's, there's stuff that build, gets built into inventory oversupply, and then you can kind of overshoot on the way down. So um, you have a class of people who have uh, very rapidly depreciating assets against which they have borrowed um, in a, uh, in a, at a time when the valuations that are being placed on those assets are dropping even more rapidly than the prices, and many of them have wound up uh, essentially uh, having to surrender large uh, quantities of securities and assets to their lenders, which in turn have been dumped on the market. And uh, these the, the general psychology of that caused a crash of the Russian stock market, which is apparently going to be uh, largely resolved by the state buying back many of these assets at discount prices. So this is an example of how you get these feedback effects, uh, and there may be other feedback effects of a limited nature that are going to spread from this kind of event back into other financial markets, and you see it in some of the emerging market problems that are now developing and which are, I guess, uh, starting to require official intervention by the IMF or uh, other countries in order to help some of the uh, countries that are major commodity producers that are going to have economic problems, but Russia is a good example. I think I speak for everybody when I thank all of you for coming and doing this. Um, my question is more of a long-term one, kind of with the Federal Reserve pumping all this money into the system. I'm curious what you think. Uh, oil has come down, but long-term inflationary pressures as well as the fact that we're adding trillions of dollars worth of new debt on an already strained economy, or I'm sorry, uh, you know, federal deficit. Um, I was curious if you could talk about kind of those long-term implications. <clears throat> Oh, I'll say something about inflation. I'll let the other people handle the tougher questions. Uh, the, uh, yeah, do, do we want to worry about the money, all the money is pumping into the system? I think the answer has got to be that's only going to be inflationary to the extent the Fed is kind of forcing it out there. It's like, no, no, we don't want the money. Yes, here, take the money. Uh, the reason the Fed's pumping all the money into the system is because there's such a huge demand for it. I mean, so, you know, for all the reasons I talked about, sort of the, the lack of confidence in any of this collateral out there. These institutions are just terrified of everything. They're just frightened by their own shadows, and they just want to hold on to like, stuff that's safe and secure, treasury securities or cash. Big demand for that. The Fed is supplying it. Once that demand goes away, the Fed is obviously thinking, well, we need to suck that back out again when the time comes. But as long as they do a good job of that, then, you know, then it's uh, not going to be inflationary. I think the more interesting question is going to be the longer-term fiscal issues, depending on how much, and there the big unknown is how much money uh, how much of the Treasury's money, how much of our money is actually going to get spent on them? Because really, strictly speaking, the $700 billion, you know, we're buying assets. We're not buying goods or services. If those turn out to be decent assets and it turns out to be a good investment for the Treasury, then, you know, we'll come out ahead. But if it turns out that it buys a lot of uh, bank stock and other assets that turns out to be valueless, someone's going to have to pay for that eventually. And then the long-term implications of that are either going to be, you know, inflationary or a greater burden for all of us going forward. Can you say? Uh, if I could just add, so the, the average uh, financial crisis costs a little over 10 percent, 12, 13 percent of GNP. Um, if that were the case for the U.S., we're talking about, what, uh, one and a half, two trillion, well, close to two trillion dollars, maybe? Mm -hmm. um, now, whether you end up having an average crisis, a cheap one like the SNLs, which were only 3% of GDP, or a barn burner like uh, Indonesia and Argentina, which were 50% of GDP, 
really depends on how well you design this program of uh, rescuing banks, injecting resources, setting up incentives so that, uh, as it's put in the press, the taxpayer gets, uh, gets paid back. And it's way too early for us to ha have a clue on that. We don't even, we don't know um, which are the banks that are going to get it. Um, the design of the program seems to be changing daily. Uh, it's still being said that there are no restrictions on dividends. Uh, in the Depression, that was one of the first things you had to do to get government money was to stop paying uh, dividends. But I think we can expect that program will evolve over time and, and improve, we hope, in design. So there are a lot of imponderables before we really know uh, the long-term cost. If we manage the crisis poorly, say, and in Europe they manage it well, um, that's probably going to end up being bad for the dollar uh, against the euro. And in the opposite circumstance, it will benefit the dollar. So we really have to l look at the details of how these programs work out in practice. Can I just add one thing from a, a practitioner's point of view? Um, it was very interesting when this was all unfolding before the $700 billion package was approved because there were literally two days when we were sitting at our desks a few weeks ago where um, the markets froze and trading stopped and trades were not settling. So we literally sat at our desks and thought the financial system had broken. And it's, you know, kind of entertaining to go to somebody's house for dinner and talk about it now, but it, it really wasn't very entertaining at the time. <laughs> Um, and it was pretty frustrating to hear people say they shouldn't be doing this and all this money and what's going to happen. It, it could have ended very differently had that not happened. So from our perspective, there was sort of an implicit faith that put that money in and make things start going again because I'm sure Jimmy can talk about this and Paul. There were a couple days where when um, the reserve fund broke the buck and um, you know, it, it stopped, and there are a lot of implications for that if that had happened. So I think it's great that they put the $700 billion in, and it will have long-term implications, you know, maybe intended or unintended, but at the time, I think it was the right thing to do. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll jump in. I, um, you know, we spent a weekend buying Bear Stearns back in March, <clears throat> which is kind of amazing when you think about it, that you started on a Friday night and announced it on a Monday morning, um, obviously with the incredible help of, um, of the Fed and, and the Treasury, both Paulson and Geithner. Um, and also I, um, I spent uh, 48 hours trying to figure out what to do about AIG. The Fed had asked ourselves and and Goldman Sachs to um, figure out, you know, what, what are we going to do here? Um, you know, this was after a weekend that we spent in the bank, all of us, top 100 people in the company, trying to figure out what we were the clearing bank for Lehman Brothers. So, so what was going to happen to Lehman? At one stage, on Saturday, you know, there was both Barclays and and uh, Bank of America looked like they were going to buy Lehman, and then, you know, Sunday morning, Bank of America buys Merrill Lynch. And Sunday night, um, we're thinking to ourselves, okay, well, it looks like Lehman is going to go bankrupt. It didn't look like anyone was going to save it or buy it. Um, and we're trying to figure out what the payment systems were going to look like the next day in clearing trades. And I was sort of minding my own business uh, in my office Monday, crack of dawn Monday, worrying about a million different Lehman-type things. And Jamie Dimon said, please get down to the Fed now um, and figure out what we're going to do with AIG. And I said, Jamie, I really don't know much about insurance companies. Um, he said, oh, you'll learn quickly. <laughs> so we spent 48 hours all day and all night uh, trying to figure out a private sector solution for AIG. And one of the things that I think makes this team of people uh, in the government that's been working so hard and so long with such great patriotic civil service for all of us is that they really work super hard on a private sector solution. And um, only if that is unavailable, and we looked at AIG and we said, look, 
you know, this company is going to need about 85 or 100 billion dollars. Um, um, a run had started on AIG Monday night, and we just, it was perfectly clear to us that AIG was probably going to last maybe Tuesday at the most. By the way, this is a company with over a trillion dollars of assets um, and literally counterparties all over the globe in every major country. So we concluded by Tuesday morning, in fact, we spent that whole night um, at your old stomping grounds uh, at the Fed. The food at the Fed is, is really not that good, actually. <laughs> it's pretty overrated. Um, and the onion soup, that's really good. <laughs> and, you know, my, my team and myself and, and um, Goldman Sachs, uh, very senior executive at Goldman, you know, we concluded and we presented to the Fed that this was kind of our conclusion here. And, uh, you know, the uh, Geithner and his team and Treasury, they, you know, in a span of hours, they went to the Hill and talked to the congressman and the president and the White House and said, look, this is, that we, this company is like just too big to let it fail, that classic, the classic line we were sort of watching the movie unfold. And um, so, so the question when you when you do these when you make these moves, you know the, you know sort of like your inflation type question, you know what is the effect down the road? Well, you don't know what the effect is down the road. All you know is what would be the effect if you didn't do it. That you have a much higher certainty of knowing, and um, you know they'll history you know, over time will debate whether this Lehman decision was the right decision or not. It was absolutely clear, though, that we all knew what was going to happen if it was let go, and, it, and all of that stuff happened just the way you thought it would. You know, the, the panic, the jobs, the lawsuits, and, um, and so on. So it's very difficult to know um, what will happen five or ten years from now if you don't, you know, if you actually perform these actions, um, but what you do know is what can happen short term. And um, so, I, I mean, I, you know, back to what Colette was saying, I, I'm a big believer in trying to, trying to find a solution um, uh, to the problem at hand to kind of protect the system, because as Colette said, there were moments in time in the last six weeks where you know, even old hands um, thought, you know, maybe the system is just not going to make it, um, you know, with these thousand point swings in the Dow and so on. So that's what, I, that's what I'd have to say about that. I, I think that the civil service that's being performed by the women and the men and the Treasury and the FDIC and uh, the Federal Reserve, I think these, these are great. These are, by the way, someone asked about advice and what to do you know, if there's no jobs on Wall Street, um, those are great things to do, and there'll be huge demands for people that want to give something back to their country and enjoy finance and like, um, you know, um, like that sort of, like economics, and all these agencies are going to be looking for people, young people, hardworking people, over the next um, couple of years to sort out this, you know, what will be, there'll be a lot of collateral damage, and it'll be very interesting work. Uh, lousy pay, however. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe the good pay will come later when they change jobs. Exactly. Um, I wonder, just given the time, can, can the, the last three of you that are here, can you guys just tell us your questions yeah, and then absolutely. we can You don't, you don't have to answer me in, in person. Um, uh, interesting, you've mentioned the last few um, comments that there's going to be big uh, job openings in the government sector. And that's the question I have for you. I'm not going to ask you to predict, because I know you don't like to predict, um, what would happen if the country nationalized the banks. Uh, we can imagine. My question to you is, how close are we to the nation nationalizing the banks? They're buying, they're taking on all this debt, they're buying assets, which hopefully will have good return. That certainly implies ownership. How close are we to nationalization of the banks? Let's get the other. 
Oh, I've been trying to understand the Fed, and the more I read about it, the more confused I get. But one book said that the Fed was a nonprofit institution, and if they make any money, they return it to the government. Another book said that the Fed uh, creates money out of nothing and charges the government interest on the money they've created. And they, I mean, they collect T bills and they collect interest on the T bills or sell the T bills or what. And it sounds so strange. I'm not sure if, if I'm making any sense at all. And I've also heard a lot of people say that we should nationalize the Fed so that it looks out for the interest of not only the business and banking community, but all the people. So, thanks. Um, I guess we've all talked about how this is a cycle and um, how at the end of this cycle is reinvestment and more confidence on the part of consumers, whether it's households of four, of four designed to uh, buy a car or whether it's colleges resuming with uh, construction and everything um, in between. But uh, also several of the panelists said that um, the next few quarters may be getting worse uh, than we already are, especially from a point of view where you see every single day on John Stewart and the Colbert Report more and more, <laughs> more and more talk about the uh, financial crisis. You also see in um, car insurance commercials saying it certainly looks like we're going into a recession. What are you going to do about your insurance? At what point does the consumer regain confidence? And I guess at what point uh, are we going to stop seeing commercials, which kind of make your heart turn down? <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Uh, who wants to jump in on our nationalizing banks? I think we've started, right? We started down, down that trail. So I don't, I mean, that's what the, oh, what's it, $125 billion that was just laid out, that's, that's kind of what it's, you know, it's starting. It's, there's certainly, it's not the classic nationalization of a bank that you would see in, particularly in an emerging market or something like that, but it, it, it is, you know, on the one hand, we sort of joke about it at the bank, like we're now civil servants, and, um, you know, we've had, there's some pretty good jokes about it, actually. Um, but, uh, but, you know, it is a move that's been made, and it's like the issue we were just talking about, which is, you know, you're not sure of the long-term consequences of putting $25 billion into J.P. Morgan and, you know, all the sort of bells and whistles that are attached to that investment, you're not sure actually what that's going to mean, but you do know that short term that if we don't start recapitalizing the banks very soon, and the U.K. actually, with their first move of major government intervention, um, actually, it was, it was the exchequer that actually came out in the Bank of England saying, hey, this is a good idea, and we sort of, maybe a couple of days later, we started, you know, lawmakers started talking about that. Um, I, I mean, I think everyone was is quite certain that if some of these banks didn't get some of this capital soon, that we would have, you know, another wave of, of selling and another wave of illiquidity, and things could get a lot worse very quickly. But I mean, we, you know, in a way, we've taken a little baby step towards that. Um, I think we're all hopeful that that's it and there is no more of it, although we're all quite convinced that many of these regionals are going to get bought, folded in. Some will probably fail, um, and um, it's possible there's some nationalization there because the program, there's still more money available. I forget what the actual amount is that's still available. Someone, I'm sure, in this panel will know it for the balance of banks who apply for it. So there'll be, there'll be more of these baby steps. I might just quickly point out, though, that uh, the nationalization, partial nationalization has gone on. It's not, it doesn't involve actually the government taking control of the banks right. the way it would because the government hasn't bought, well, a majority stake, number one. And number two, the shares are non-voting. So we're still a long ways from the government coming in and saying, hey, we're going to take over the bank and tell them how to run things. No board seats, yeah. none of that no stuff. No board seats, none of that stuff. So we've got a ways to go before we get to sort of that more, that fuller kind of nationalization. Folks, we're uh, already five minutes after uh, when I said I'd bring it to an end, so please join me in thanking our five incredible panelists.